Ahoy, Creepster crew! This be Captain Cat of the great ship Creepinati. Your ears be officially commandeered by a paranormal chicks. And I'm Carrie. And we are Paranormal Chicks. Sinister Sightings 29. And y'all just heard from Kat, and it was amazing. Uh, freak amazing. Great job. Dying. <laughs> what, are we on the Titanic? Well, she is the captain. <laughs> but if you want to introduce an episode, you know the drill. Head on to patreon.com slash the APC podcast. Check out the tiers. See what you want to do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you see... These last two, they have had their personality in them. Mm-hmm. You can do whatever you want. Well, well within reason. Within reason now. I mean, you're not trying to get us, please don't get us sued or anything. <laughs> we like getting to know y'all's personality and Absolutely. stuff. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> don't do that, though. Don't do that. Well, that's my personality. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well. Hello, ladies. Can I just say, I love your podcast so much. It has inspired me to start my own podcast with my boyfriend that includes my dogs and murder. Nothing is official yet. That's awesome. Um, We need all the deets. Yes, congratulations. Because this was back in May. So hopefully it's official. And dogs, murder, yes. Unless the dogs are being murdered. Oh, God, no. Then we don't want to know. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Keep that shit to yourself. But that sounds amazing. And also, thank you so much. All right, here is my story. Back when I was either 16 or 17, I was at my boyfriend's house later at night. We may or may not have been getting down and dirty. Okay. Don't tell my mom. Don't tell my mom. His room was in the basement. I was moaning. The bed was being noisy and annoying. All right, get it. (laughs) The reason I was being loud was because I thought my boyfriend's family was out. Oh, shit. But then we were chilling, watching Netflix after. Everything was fine until we heard footsteps upstairs. Oh, shit. I started to panic, thinking that his family heard us and started to practically hyperventilate. I hurriedly put on my clothes and my shoes and told him I was ready to go home. I braced myself to face his family and hopefully get out of there quickly. When we got out of his room and up the first set of stairs, we noticed that all the lights were out. He started turning lights on and calling out to his family. He checked every room and the garage. Nobody was there. So he called his little brother to see if they had dropped by quickly. They hadn't. I literally turned to him and half screamed, half whispered, Holy shit, was that a ghost? (laughs) I said this because my boyfriend is super haunted. What? Having astral projected as a child and even seen the hat man, despite never having heard anything about shadow people, I had had no paranormal experiences previously. We opened the front door to the darkness outside. I got this horrible feeling that there was something to the right of the house by the bushes. I turned my phone flashlight on and looked around. I couldn't see the neighbor's dog that's usually up and barking at us. I got the courage to walk out to my car with my boyfriend. It took us a few minutes with the door open, just looking out to actually make it to the car. We sat in the car, me in the passenger seat, and I looked up at the front door. It was so dark. I felt that there was such an unwelcoming presence there. It was so unsettling. Eventually, the mood lifted as we drove to my house. I finally told my boyfriend about my feeling, and he told me he had felt the same thing about the location and the mood. Him feeling the same as me felt like it was real and most likely paranormal because the veil for my boyfriend is very thin, and he can often feel things that I can't. I can't imagine how strong it must have been for him if it was as strong as it was for me. Also, my panic attack was very real because I heard the wood creak and slowly move above us, and I truly believed that his parents and brothers were up there. Golly. 
Another strange experience is when we, me and my boyfriend, were driving through a winding canyon at around 1130 at night to get to a camping spot where my parents were. We were having a heart-to-heart about his paranormal experiences and dreams he's had. How he's been blessed multiple times along with the house and it stays with him, following him. Something about the dark trees passing and the topic of conversation made my hair stand up and skin get cold. We were in a peaceful, comfortable silence when I saw something in the road. Mm -mm. We were far enough away that I couldn't really make it out. At first, I thought it was a brown bag. Then I panicked, thinking it was a cat hunched over roadkill. And then it turned around. (gasps) It was a huge owl that turned its head all the way around and stared directly into my eyes as I screamed. That fucking murder bird. Right? We hit it, (gasps) and I felt the force of it at my feet. I was hysterical and sobbing, telling my boyfriend to pull over so we could look and see if we were dragging it. He told me it wasn't safe to pull off the road because of the winding turns and how dark it was. Someone could have hit us. It took around 20 minutes before we made it to a small town with a gas station. The front of my car was covered in a white powder, most likely from its wings. No damage to my car, but it has affected me. I didn't sleep peacefully that night, and later I couldn't get it off my mind, so I looked up local owls and I came upon some Native American information. Apparently, killing an owl is very bad and can mean your own death is near. Oh, shit. We drove past the spot and didn't see any owls on the side of the road. Later that summer, I took multiple kinds of bottles of pills in an attempt to kill myself, but luckily lived. Maybe that was my death experience. Thanks for reading, Hannah Banana. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that. I wonder, was it real? I know, like with the white powder and... Like, could that could have been like a bag of donuts. <laughs> oh my God. No, like, I mean, really and truly, not making it, not making light of it. But like... What the fuck? Bag of powder donuts. donuts. I know. Was it, but like, truly, like, was there any blood? Was there a little Debbie truck around? I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> no, really and truly, though. Like, was there blood? Like, could it have been... Yeah. Like, again, with the feeling that you had and all that, I wonder if it was really an owl or, like, a vision, you know? Yeah. I'm not saying the experience wasn't real, but if it was not supernatural, a, paranormal, whatever you want to call it, and it yeah. was, like, a vision. Not a physical owl. Yes. Wow. Whew, that was heavy. Hot and heavy. It was good, though. Oh, yeah. yeah that did go a little... <laughs> <laughs> Your girl needs a little. (laughs) Right? We're jealous. Okay. Can we get more details? (laughs) Okay. But seriously, thank you so much, Hannah Banana. Yes. And we are so glad that you're in a better place and that you are with us. Yes, definitely. Hello, ladies. I just want to say first that I love your podcast so much. It has motivated me to tell you about my situation. Thank you so much. First, I'll give you a quick background so you don't get confused about all of this. My name is Jackson, and I'm a 15-year-old witch. I studied and follow the Wiccan religion. My choice of religion has disappointed my parents, so they don't really like me talking about it. Instead, I tell my friends about all this. They like to go to abandoned buildings with me and use my Ouija board with me as well. I basically protect them from anything remotely evil. I can feel the presence of the spirits... I don't exactly see see through people dressed in old outfits. Instead, I feel their presence. Sometimes, if they're strong enough spirits, they'll talk to me. Anyway, because of this weird ability, I'm not really sure what to call it, a lot of weird things happen in my life. My first ghost encounter is with the poltergeist and is a repeated thing. Every Wednesday at exactly 8.30 p.m., the plastic skeleton in my room, I call him Jerry, falls forward and off my shelf. It started about a week after I placed Jerry in my room. That Wednesday, he just fell forward. At first, I thought it was the wind coming in from my window that pushed him over since it was a rather windy night. The next week, however, on that Wednesday, he fell forward again. It definitely wasn't wind 
seeing as my window was shut along with my bedroom door. Mm-hmm. My, fa- mm-hmm. my fan wasn't on and neither was the AC. Well, why are you living in a sweat box? Oh my God, I would be, uh, I'd be Alex Mack. Uh- <laughs> oh, Lord. I'm hot just reading that. Oh, God. Where are you from? Iceland? <laughs> you mean Greenland? Yeah, Greenland. <laughs> Geography, y'all. Okay. I told my mom about Jerry falling, and she took one look at him and told me it was the weight of the scarf I placed on him that pushed him forward. That didn't make sense because Jerry's leaning back against the wall. There was no way he could have fell over without a solid push. This happens every Wednesday now, and it's just sort of become part of my routine. This poltergeist doesn't only mess around with Jerry. They like to switch the TV channels when I'm in the kitchen, just so I have to take the time to change it back. Uh Uh-uh. Like Carrie says, don't mess with my sleep. Uh Uh-uh. Don't mess with my fucking TV. Mm Mm-hmm. They like to knock on doors and walls and open random cabinets. Sometimes they get on my nerves, but they don't hurt anybody, so I leave them be. Ooh, uh-uh. Can't they get stronger and stuff, though, and be worse? Another story is one I can't really explain. It involves my little brother, who will give him a different name to protect his privacy. We'll call him Colin. So, Colin also believes in ghosts and loves listening to my stories and encounters. But recently, he's been having non-explainable nightmares, so my parents have told me to stop telling him these, quote, fairy tales. He's been begging me to tell him, and I told him I can't until I figure out where his nightmares are coming from. That same night, I woke up to my door opening, and a small figure walks in. Mm Mm-mm. No. Is that a fucking fairy? I sit up slightly, squinting my eyes to watch the figure as it sat on the edge of my bed. Uh Uh-uh. Suddenly, my brother's voice says, Jackson, I can't sleep. I mentally groan. I thought he was going to start coming to me about his nightmares so our parents can think he no longer had them and I could tell him my ghost encounters again. I respond with, Colin, why don't you go to mom? No response. I reach for the flashlight that I always have by my bed for late night reading and flash it at the figure. No one's there. Uh Oh, no. I look at my door, which is still open the amount the figure opened. I then check my phone for the time. 2.30 2.30 a.m. I couldn't sleep that night. What was it? Oh, my. Uh-uh. I, can't, I picture those, like, fairy things. You know what I'm talking mm-hmm. about? What are they? I only know those from Ghosts and the Burbs. <laughs> yeah. My third story is about a doll. I don't know if it's just the poltergeist in my house or if it's a completely different spirit. I visited an antique shop with my dad one day and was drawn to this Chucky doll. No. Why? Chucky doll? Don't be drawn to a Chucky doll. I thought it was going to be like an antique doll, but Chucky, Chucky. It sounds funny and fake, but I really do have it. If you want picture proof, I can email you one, but this doll really does have some weird and cliche stuff. The doll moves. Uh Uh-uh. Every night, he will be in one spot, but the next morning, he'll be in another. At first, I didn't really mind him moving, but then he got dangerous. What? I've woken up with bruises all over my legs and the doll sitting in my office chair facing me. What the dear David's going on? I've woken up with these bruises so many times that my friends and some teachers were concerned about my life at home. Oh my gosh. The bruising on my legs were bad, but when he left my room and woke my little brother up, it was the last straw. I started to try different things to prevent the doll from moving. I've put him up on many high shelves, tried to communicate with the spirit... I've brought him to a different house to see if he still moved in there. My friend, she let me leave him at her house since she doesn't really believe, called me in the middle of the night in tears. The doll had knocked the lamp on her bedside table over, barely missing her head on the bed. I picked the doll up and took him home after apologizing profusely to my friend. She forgave me, thank God. I spent that day trying to figure out why the doll was so energetic at night when I remembered this one story about a rogue doll... I was told by one of my great aunts. She dealt with a rogue doll who just wanted to be put to bed every night. So that night, I leaned the doll against my dresser and put a folded blanket over him before going to bed. I woke up and saw the doll still under the bed. 
I think I'm going to leave this off here. I have a lot more stories I can share later if you guys would like. Thank you for reading my stories, and I'm sorry about any grammatical, Mm -hmm. spelling, or punctual errors. I really do love your podcast so much. Thank you for making school days more tolerable. With love, Jackson. Oh, thank you. Dang, Jackson. You in danger. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Oh, my gosh. You need to be, I don't know, get rid of the doll. Mm Mm-hmm. Tell the poltergeist to leave. (laughs) That's all I know because I don't know shit about this shit. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, we want to hear more stories. Mm-hmm. Also, you can listen to us at school. <laughs> I got in trouble for talking at school when I, I was your age. And um, I had to walk 20 miles. <laughs> Donna and I had to sit in front of the teacher's desk because we got in trouble for talking. In 12th fucking grade, y'all. Yeah, and she would say, Donna, Karen, <laughs> didn't she call us that? Yes. Donna, Karen, stop talking. And we would look at each other and be like, damn, we weren't talking. We, we weren't talking. Hey, y'all, my friend Jess introduced me to your podcast, and I have been listening to it nonstop since. Yay, hey, and thanks, Jess. Yes. I'm 21, and I've had a few paranormal experiences in my life, but the majority of them took place while I was at St. Vincent College. I've now transferred schools but not due to the paranormal. I changed majors. LOL. Me too. A lot. A lot, a lot. Mm -hmm. Which is why I'm $8 billion in student loan debt. (laughs) Y'all, I'm not lying. When I went to, like, college, I thought you could really be, like, three things. A teacher, a lawyer, or in the medical field. Mm -hmm. Medical field? Oh, hell no. Mm -hmm. Hell no. Lawyer? Hell no. I watch Legally Blonde. That shit's hard. (laughs) I really thought you were going to say SVU or something. (laughs) Not Legally Blonde. And so I was like, teacher, I'm good at history. Cool. I like it. Then I got there and I was like, wait, y'all are like in tourism management? I remember that. You being like, tourism management is a thing? Yeah. I I should do that. But you never changed your major. Mm -mm, Because lazy and I was already like two semesters in really and then she would have to walk all the way across the campus to get a new advisor Mm -hmm. no I'm just kidding (laughs) so I was like well I mean I I did like history and whatever and kids if you're anything like me you get a liberal arts degree but you don't use it just say it shows I'm dedicated that I start a task and I finish Mm. I'm a great researcher uh, you know, all of that shit. Like, oh, you gotta, yeah, you yeah. gotta make Shishy it. it up. Mm-hmm. You're like, I mean, also, I love to spend money. <laughs> right. <laughs> but yeah, that's what you gotta do. Mm-hmm. So, to backtrack a little, I was not very serious about college and high school and only applied to three schools, not really knowing much about them. Same. Well, okay, I applied to one. Late. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. Because, well, Lil Donna, hey, Lil Donna, she had big dreams, and I was going to go to NYU and do photography. That was, like, my ultimate dream. So I was going to take a whole year off, save up my little money, like, actually get a job, do all of this, and then it was like, the fuck I think I, like, who the fuck I think I am? I ain't leaving my mama. Mm -mm. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. So, whatever. Okay. Okay. But I mean, chase your chase your dreams, peeps. <laughs> <laughs> Last minute, I chose St. Vincent and moved in August after I graduated high school. Okay, to give some backstory on St. Vincent, it is run by monks that live on a monastery on campus. In the 40s, St. Vincent was not a college yet, but an orphanage. There was a huge fire that burnt down most of the campus, and it's a relatively small campus, and most of the buildings are connected. And all of the children in the orphanage died. (gasps) I think this is part of what makes a campus prone to paranormal activity. Also, there's a cemetery that is basically bigger than the campus that's connected where all the children were buried and all the monks. So I don't think that helps either. Oh, my God. All that residual energy. Oh, my gosh. Fast forward to August, my freshman year. I had a friend who was two years older who already went to St. Vincent. I was visiting him Sunday night before class had started. Uh-huh. I swear to God, Donna, I was just going to be like, uh-huh. Uh-huh. There was a huge thunderstorm outside, and I had to walk across campus to get back to my dorm to prepare for my first day of classes. I left his room and began walking back to my dorm. 
I had to pass through this central point on campus that had a few street lights, some benches, and a bunch of trees. It was still pouring down rain, and I see a monk sitting on the bench with his head slightly down and his habit covering his face, so he just kind of looked like a black figure. I remember thinking how odd it was for a monk to be out this late at night. It was only around 11, but the monks had to be back at the monastery for evening mass around 8 and only came back out if there was a student mass at 10, which there wasn't. Also, the monastery was on the complete opposite side of the campus, and it was pouring down rain. I felt a little uneasy and quickened my steps to get past him. Before I knew it, I was about 10 feet away from him when the streetlights flickered off and then on, and he was gone. (gasps) I looked around, and he was absolutely nowhere to be seen. The campus is very open, and you can basically see everything no matter where you stand. So I panicked because he was nowhere. I ran back to my dorm and immediately to my friend's room. She was just as confused as I was, so he called the friend who I had been visiting. After I tell him what happened, he immediately says, Sarah, you saw the headless monk. (gasps) I remember thinking, what the fuck is a headless monk? You're crazy. He then tells me the story of the headless monk. Quite some time ago, before there was a water system on campus, it was the monk's duty to go to the water tower, which is still present on campus, and fill up the buckets of water for the next day. Fuck that shit. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. But I'm not about a life of service. (laughs) I was going to say, but I didn't take a vow of whatever. Yeah. This particular monk had the water duty for the night and fell asleep forgetting about it. Oh. He woke up late at night and remembered he had to go fill the buckets of water, so he went to the water tower to do so. It was pouring down rain as he climbed up the water tower. His foot slipped and his habit became caught on the water tower as he fell and immediately internally decapitated. Oh my god. Someone found him hanging the next morning. After that and up to this day, Staff and students report seeing a monk wearing his habit with the hood up on campus, but never seeing his face. No one has ever gotten closer than 10 feet away before he vanishes. In the main spot on campus, he's seen exactly where I saw him. There are a few more strange experiences from my time at St. Vincent and some creepy things that happened before I got there, but I will have to send those in another time before this email turns into a book. I hope you guys enjoyed my sinister sighting and love y'all, Sarah. Oh my gosh. Like in your first night. Like, what holy the crap. Fuck? Uh-uh. That's such a sad story. Mm-hmm. Like, about why he's headless and that he had to do water duty. And it sounds like, does he only show up on rainy nights? <gasps> Maybe. And around that time, mm-hmm. when he, like, woke up and was yes. like, so he's probably disappearing when he wakes up and goes, oh, shit, I gotta go do the, yeah. the water. Yeah. Meanwhile, just catch the fucking rain in a bucket. <laughs> Fuck it. Thank you so much for that. And we want all of them. We mm-hmm. want more. Hey, ladies, this is how my first sleepover really fucking sucked. Oh, fuck. When I was in kindergarten, I went on my first sleepover to a friend's house. We were supposed to go camping at a local lake 20 minutes from our hometown, but the girl's dad got out of jail that day and decided to surprise his unsuspecting family with a trip. Instead of just taking me home, it was decided I'd go too. Oh, gosh. Uh Uh-uh. Before I knew it, I was loaded into the old, smoky, disgusting suburban, and we were off. I was crying. The girl and her brother and her mom were crying. Oh, my gosh. We drove forever. We drove until the cedar trees of Central Texas turned into the pine trees of North Texas. Fuck. That's that's a long fucking time. Mm Mm-hmm. We ended up at these odd compound-like cabins. We are greeted with guns. (gasps) Luckily, they welcomed us in. This was apparently the dad's family. Mind you, I was supposed to be home by now. Oh, my gosh. This had been going on for two days. What? This is Texas in the 90s. No Amber Alerts yet. I was allowed to call my mom and let them know I'd be home eventually. (laughs) Oh, my God. 
what the abducted in plain sight? Right. So I go into the cabin, and this giant man in only overalls hands me a phone off the top of the fridge, plugs it in, and dials a number for me. Oh, fuck. Unfortunately, Mom and Dad didn't answer. <gasps> no. So I left a very rambling and tearful message. God. We slept in the back of the Suburban that night. I can't remember when I finally went home. I'm pretty sure we spent two more nights, but my memory is foggy about this. I did finally get dropped back off. They literally stopped the Suburban just long enough for me to jump out and then push my stuff out with me. <gasps> what? <laughs> I run into the house and my mom and dad were very happy to see me. So were the Texas Rangers that were posted at my house. (gasps) That's why they shoved her out. (laughs) Uh They asked me questions about where I'd been and what happened. And once that was done, they went off to my friend's parents' house. I have no idea what happened after that. I never asked and we never speak of it. I do know that the girl's dad wasn't around after that. Needless to say, me and my sister only slept over at family members' houses or friends that my mom and dad would literally interview their family before we could go over. (laughs) I don't blame them. So now y'all know about how I was basically kidnapped when I was six. Love y'all, Kayla K. Oh my gosh. Holy shit. Like, what? That's like some backwoods cult shit. Yes. When she said compound-like thing, I was uh-huh. like, oh, fuck, it's a cult. I know. You're never getting out. Yes. Oh, my gosh. And that he had to plug in the phone? Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. Oh, could you imagine sleeping in the Suburban, too? I, look, no. it's, that's fucking uncomfortable. <laughs> and clearly, the family didn't want to, like, the mom, the yeah. little girl, and the, and the brother, they didn't want to go with them anyway. Right. So that's telling in itself. Mm-hmm. Whew. Your poor parents. I bet they were shitting. Oh, my God. Golly. Well, we're glad you're safe. Yes. Greetings and salutations. Hello, ladies. I'm a new listener, and I absolutely love you guys and your podcast. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I am a new first-time mom who recently moved with my daughter from Ohio to Georgia. My boyfriend and I were planning to move this summer to be closer to my family, But I started to have postpartum depression issues, and it was decided she and I would move earlier so we could have the extra help. Man, postpartum is no joke. Yeah. Bless y'all's hearts. Like, I cannot, like, I know what my depression feels like. I cannot imagine how postpartum must feel. Mm Mm-mm. Me either. And then the added stress of no sleep and this thing you've got to care for like yeah. y'all are beyond strong like that's amazing that for, you can do what you do for real her boyfriend works long hours and her daughter jasper is a colicky thing that keeps her homebound most of the time so the isolation was getting to her oh gosh i'm so sorry mm. babies are kids babies and kids are fucking hard yes my boyfriend has to stay at his job in ohio for two more months until he can transfer down here, so it's been rather lonesome being apart. I don't know anyone in the area aside from my family, and they're away on vacation. So I've been looking around for podcasts to occupy my time, and I found you. Thank you for doing what you do. You make a difficult time far more bearable. When I found out you wanted listener stories, I knew immediately the first one I had to send to you. It's the scariest story I have, though I have many I'm excited to share eventually. Now, after that long-winded intro, here's my creepiest story. My parents split up when I was in high school. My dad moved out and into a duplex in town. We lived in the boonies, and many of my other creepy stories takes place in that house, but I digress. My younger brother and I would spend some weekends at my dad's, and for the first few months, nothing unusual happened. Then, one night, around 3 a.m., I woke up to a faint sound outside of my second-story bedroom window. I tried to ignore it and go back to sleep, but it kept getting louder and louder, and I realized it was a cat crying angrily down the sidewalk below. It went on so long and got so loud, I got out of bed, opened the window so I could look down and see if I could see the cat making all the noise. I didn't have to look hard. There was a black cat right below my window, and it was looking right at me, looking pissed and continuing to yowl loudly. I instantly felt creeped out, so I told it to shut up, (laughs) close the window, and got back into bed. 
I fell asleep to the sound of it continuing to cry. In the morning, I asked my dad and brother if they heard it. Our rooms were all next to each other, but neither of them heard a thing. The next night, the same thing happened. It continued to happen every night I stayed there for several weeks. Mm-mm. No one else ever hearing it, and then it stopped. I never felt so relieved. After a few weeks of nothing, I finally stopped feeling on edge and had nearly forgotten about it until summer rolled around. My bedroom was at the front of the house, so one of my windows opened up onto the porch roof, which had a large tree running alongside of it. It was very hot one night, and I didn't have a fan in my room, so I left the window open. As I was falling asleep, I suddenly remembered the cat, and I had a panic thought. What if it can get on the roof using the tree? If the window was open, it could get in my room. I was very tired and had already gotten comfortable, and it was so dang hot. I really didn't want to get up and shut the window. So I rationalized that the cat was unlikely to come back. I hadn't seen it in weeks, and the tree seemed like it would be hard to climb. I told myself it would be fine and went to sleep. I awoke with a start just before dawn with my back to the open window. I rolled over, and there, sitting on the windowsill, was the black cat. No. I feel any attempts to describe my fear and panic could never do it justice. The cat was glaring at me with that look that I can only describe as pure evil and filled with hatred. As I looked in its eyes, I immediately felt paralyzed. My heart began to pound, and I felt like I was being suffocated, all of the air being sucked out of my lungs. I don't know how long I was frozen in its glare, but the next thing I know, it was morning. The sun was coming up and I had blacked out. I immediately looked up to the window, but there was nothing there. I wondered if it had all been a dream. I got up, walked to the window, and looked out. Immediately, I saw something black up against the garage across the street. My heart leapt up in my chest. I stared intently, trying to determine if it was a cat. As a light breeze kicked up, the thing moved slightly in the wind. The way it moved, I realized it was a trash bag that had been twisted closed, the twisted up part swaying softly in the breeze. I felt so relieved, I let out a long, hard sigh, and then the trash bag stood up, (gasps) turned around, and it had a face. What? It was the cat, and it was looking right at me now with all the rage I had seen earlier. I knew then it had been in my room with me earlier. As I continued to look at it dumbly, it let out what I can only describe as a terrifying scream. It snapped me out of my trance. I slammed the window shut and jumped back into bed, staring at the window, expecting the cat to appear at any minute. It never did, and that's the last time I ever saw it. Years later, when I got into the creepy, I read about spiritual harassment by demonic entities— Basically, someone sends a demon to target a specific person. My experience was very typical of those accounts I have read, and I'm now convinced that's what's happened, though who would have wanted to target me will always be a mystery. Thanks for listening to my long story. I look forward to sharing and hearing more, and thank you again for keeping a creepy girl company. Creep it real. Love, Melissa. P.S. I have attached the picture of a painting that reminds me of the cat, though it doesn't nearly convey just how evil it looked. And y'all, it's the cat painting, and Tiffany has this in her house, and I about died when I saw the picture. So we'll include the picture with our show notes. Yeah, with our show notes. Also, that warms my freaking heart that we can keep you any kind of company, Mm -hmm. because like Carrie said, you... Are badass. Badass. Capital B. Also, who the fuck did that to you? Right? I wonder if there's a way to find out. Mm. I mean, nothing I want to dabble in. but (laughs) (laughs) Don't do a Ouija board. No. Yeah, nothing I want to dabble in. But I bet there is a way to find Mm -hmm. out. And I want to know right meow. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, well, we're moving on now. Okay. (laughs) Okay. That sounds perfect. Okay. This one's titled (laughs) Raging Cajun Disorder and Haunted Bridge. Oh, oh, a haunted bridge. Donna's favorite. Okay. Hey, y'all. Picture it. 
me in a prom dress, in a hospital bed, and my mama slapping the shit out of me <laughs> for messing with Haints. Oh, fuck. Which is a southern word for spirits. So I was listening to another podcast, and they brought up a disorder called Jumping Frenchman of Maine. A very rare disorder that I just happen to have, but a very mild case. I'm also one of the very few females that have it. So just a tiny synopsis. Jumping Frenchman of Maine is an extremely rare disorder characterized by an unusually extreme startle reaction. So basically, your normal starter reaction is automatic involuntary response to a sudden or unexpected situation like loud noises or your cousin jumping out at you during a scary damn movie and scaring the piss out of you <laughs> and then poking you and calling you a titty baby. Oh, gosh. <laughs> that was me. People with jumping Frenchmen of Maine, why is it called that? Do this and more, like jumping, screaming, hitting, throwing shit, repeating back words or phrases, involuntary mimic movements or gestures. Some involuntarily swear, some exhibit automatic obedience after a startle and do whatever is commanded of them in the moment. Oh my gosh. It's only found in a few parts of the world, one being Maine, Avi, and one being Louisiana. Whoa, I've never heard of this. Where I'm from, it's referred to as Rage and Cajun. And while it's gotten better as I've grown, I still have what my doctors call the reaction tick to a certain extent. According to my doctor, it's part of a panic disorder that is hereditary. Loud noises out of nowhere are my main trigger. As a child, gunshots, train horns, fireworks, etc. would put me into full-blown seizures. Oh, gosh. Toasters, opening biscuit cans, popping bottles make me stiffen up and then turn jelly and collapse. Oh my gosh. Now, as an adult, it's not as bad, no seizures anymore, and I'm able to control it with anxiety meds that I don't ever take and therapy. Also, food and vodka help immensely. <laughs> now, that's the medical reason for this, uh, quote, affliction. The Bayou reason... Well, my papa also had it, and his reasoning is a whole different shindig. Oh, fuck. According to him, we have it due to a curse from Julia Brown, a.k.a. Julia Black, and Julia White, facepalm, I don't know. Julia Brown, I did her. Mm -hmm. Any hoozle, she was a voodoo priestess who would curse people that wronged her. So, you know, people at that time were piss leg petrified of her. <laughs> One of her gifts were predictions of deadly disasters, and when she died, it said she cursed everyone, saying, one day I'm going to die, and I'm going to take you all with me, amongst other cursy type stuff. <laughs> oh, my God. Yes, I remember her. That was right before she passed in 1915, and on the day of her crowded-ass funeral, a horrible hurricane hit the town, causing a tidal wave that swept through to kill hundreds of people and trashed three villages. Um, why did I not read your email uh -huh. when I was doing all my research? According to the story, Julia Brown, along with all of those that had been killed at her funeral, were buried in a mass grave somewhere in Manshack Swamp. Well, she was a real person, and can you guess where I might be from? No, I'm not on any episodes of Swamp People. <laughs> and guess where some of my relatives were in 1915? <gasps> What? Now, in this area, we have the bridge called Manshack Bridge that goes over Manshack Swamp. That bitch is haunted. Oh, my gosh. And I mean haunted. My prom night, we, myself and some friends, went out to the bridge to contact her and ask her for forgiveness for our ancestors. Oh. I was a teenager. Don't come for me. <laughs> <laughs> The reason was, I was fucking tired of being screwed with by everyone and living with this stupid panic disorder. So I told her I was very sorry that my dumbass forefathers didn't respect her or treat her kindly when all she was doing was trying to help and heal. That I understood what it was like to be different and disrespected and to please let me live peacefully. I didn't mind the anxiety part. I can learn to live with that, but no more seizures. That night on the bridge... I had a very big, like, stayed in the hospital for three days type of thing and my very last seizure. Oh, my gosh. That night, the fog rolled up from the swamp, as it tends to do in Louisiana, and kept going until it covered the bridge where we were sitting in a circle doing voodoo chants. 
All I remember is the fog, my friend at the time saying, oh my God, and waking up in the hospital. Holy fuck. Now, I can't confirm this, but all of the people there said I stiffened up and they swear my eyes green turned brown, looked at them angrily, softened, and I smiled before my eyes rolled back and I did the epileptic extravaganza. (laughs) Gosh. I'm not trying to offend anybody by poking fun of epilepsy, but after years of the meds and seizures, I got to have my joy somewhere. I won't go into too much detail about Julia in case you want to learn about it yourself, but I do have more stories about living out there, the tours, and the local stories and personal stories. Dang, and that was from Jessica, so, whew. And, yeah, if you want to know more, we covered that. Well, I covered it. Carrie listened and probably didn't believe it. In episode 61. No, I always believe that Louisiana voodoo mm-hmm. shit. Yeah. Mm-mm. So, yeah. And, oh, and if you haven't listened to that one, it's called Reupholstering with Ed Gein. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I do Ed Gein. <laughs> <laughs> and I believe that shit. <laughs> wow, that was a good story. Yes. Um, I'm so glad that you've got your anxiety well controlled. Yes. Oh, my gosh. And no more seizures. Bless your heart. Golly. And we learned a new thing. I had never heard of that. Mm -hmm. Hey, girls. I absolutely love you and your podcast. I've been marathoning through it every day I can since I found it. I really want to tell you a couple of spooky stories. I'll shoot another email in a bit, but this is the start. I grew up in a haunted house. It was normal for us. We lived just off a very dangerous highway in Wisconsin. People had accidents there all the time, including deadly ones. We always figured the spirits we witnessed were from that. Now, I know it had portals. What the fuck? Holy shit. Contact, what's his name? That guy? Jack Osborne? (laughs) Yes, contact him. (laughs) Portals to hell, Uh that show. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. It was very rare that we saw the same thing twice, so we really believe it was a place spirits came through. Perhaps even a rest stop. Anyhow, my mom and I have always been very sensitive about things, living and dead. We would regularly see people walking by the windows when no one was around. I have one memory of me being inside watching TV with my grandfather. She was mowing the lawn. Every time she would come close, she would look in confused. Finally, I walked out to see if she wanted me to take over mowing. We had a very large lawn and it took a couple of hours. Instead, she asked me who was in the house with us. She had seen a tall man in tan clothes standing behind my grandfather's wheelchair every time she went past. Uh -uh. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. He ain't supposed to be there. Uh Uh-uh. There was also a lot of activity in the basement. My brother and our cousin witnessed five white shapes hovering above them one night as they slept down there. They couldn't move or scream the whole time they were there. I believe it lasted about a half an hour. Oh, shit. That's a long time. Yes. In my teen years, I spent a lot of time in the basement as well. I would play video games, read, paint, or just have quiet time. I would spend hours down there with no problem. Also, adding to the portal idea, there were a few times where the entire feeling of the space was wrong. I would head down planning to stay and would have to leave right away. A fight or flight response would take over and I would run for it. The worst thing was once going down there to toss a box in the furnace room. We had a wood-burning stove to supplement our gas. Since I spent so much time down there, I was in charge of keeping the wood stocked and chopped. We had a hatchet that hung on the wall by two nails supporting the blade. I was heading down and saw movement. The hatchet was swinging by itself on the nails. Uh -uh. It was high enough that none of our critters could have knocked (laughs) into it. And it was swinging hard as if someone had just smacked it. I tossed the box in the general direction and noped the hell out. Uh -uh. It took a couple of days for me to work up the courage to go back down. Everything felt safe again, though. My brother died when I was 13, and due to my grandparents moving in with us full time, I moved into his old room. I was the annoying younger sister, so he hated me in his room. After I moved in there, he would mess with me. Lights, TV, and my stereo would turn on and off. He said, get up out of my room. Mm-hmm. Usually when I wasn't in there, but sometimes when I was. 
I know it wasn't my mom since she didn't know how to work most of my electronics. (laughs) Same. My reading lamp would also fall over randomly, especially when I was up too late. Just like an older brother. Get your ass to bed. Uh Like Will tells Donna. Go the fuck to sleep. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) To end on a fun spooky note, I've always hated dolls. The older they are, the more I hate them. Mm -hmm. Somewhere in my childhood, I received a Spanish-style porcelain doll. It stood on a high shelf in my room. It never did anything creepy beyond existing, but I hated it with a passion. Every night before going to sleep, I would throw stuffed animals at it until I knocked it down. (laughs) My mom kept checking the shelf, thinking it was at an angle because I wouldn't admit that it scared me. She finally took it out so it wouldn't break. I told her years later, and she thought it was hilarious. (laughs) Thanks so much for your podcast and giving us a space to talk about the weird stuff we like and experience. Renata Hawks. That was so good. Yes. So sorry about your brother, though. Mm Mm-hmm. But it's awesome that he he was messing with you. Yes, he was like, okay, little sister. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for the email and for listening. And you should definitely check out Portals to Hell. Oh, my gosh, yeah. Because if you've got a portal. <laughs> if you got a portal, it goes to hell. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, ladies. My ghost story happened when I was on vacation in Atlantic Beach, North Carolina. At the time, I was training for my first half marathon and was very dedicated and sticking to a training schedule. Because the temps would hit 90 plus degrees during the day, I decided I would run at 5 a.m. every morning to beat the heat. The first three days, I stuck to my plan and ran down the road from the beach house to the gate at Fort Macon and came back. Bless you for your determination. Mm -hmm. Fort Macon is a Civil War era fort that saw one battle where the North overtook it, but surprisingly, only one death occurred in the battle. Also, along the road to the fort are historical signs explaining that the Union soldiers hid out in the dunes there before attacking. For the fourth morning, I had decided to skip my early run because I had gotten sunburned the previous day and wasn't feeling well at all. So, I'm sound asleep, and right about 5.30 a.m. or so, I wake up to the sound of three knocks in my bedroom. I was alone in the room, and no one else was even sleeping on the same floor as my room. Uh Uh-uh. Nope. The knocks were in my room. Mm -mm. Not on the door or outside. I hear them again. Uh Uh-uh. And now I sit up, wide awake. It sounded like wrapping on wood. Three distinct firm knocks. I wasn't scared, but really amazed and confused as to what was actually happening. I hear them again. The sound is to my right, near the bedside table. I decide to stand up, walk a few steps over, and turn on the light. As I'm standing there, trying to make sense of this, the three knocks happen again. But now it's coming from my left side, in the corner of the room. Oh my gosh. It's like because I moved closer to the original spot, it moved away from me. Mm -mm. I also heard a rustling sound on the floor in the corner. So I got back in bed, confused and tired, not being able to figure this out. I may have heard the knocks one more time. I can't remember. I wanted to go back to sleep at this point. So I said to myself in my head, please be quiet. I have to sleep now. I didn't hear the knocks ever again. I kept thinking about this experience and sometime later it dawned on me what may have happened. My theory is that the spirit of the soldier saw me running those three mornings bright and early, and on the fourth morning, when I was still laying in bed at 5.30, tried to wake me up to get my lazy butt out of bed and (laughs) to run. It totally cracks me up to think that, but of course, I'll never really know what it actually was. Thanks for reading, and creep it real, Stacy. Oh my gosh. I bet it was. It probably was. He's like... I don't know. I sounded like the Andrew sisters, not like the little yeah. morning thing, but you get it. He's like, if I got to get up mm-hmm. to run in the morning, you got to get up to run in the morning. Uh-huh. Oh my gosh. Dang. Mm-mm. And I would be the same way. I am too tired to play Marco Polo. Uh huh. We are not playing hot and cold. <laughs> I do not care where you are. Leave me the fuck alone. Just get the fuck out of here. Don't fuck with my sleep. Oh my gosh. Mm mm. 
Look, I say I can't afford a, a personal trainer, but I do not need a paranormal one, okay? No. 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 <laughs> That's how my niece Sally says it. No. <laughs> Mm-mm. Don't need it. Thank you so much, Stacy, for writing yes. in. Thank you all for writing them in. Those were so great. Yes. And y'all keep sending them in. Long, short, anywhere in between. It doesn't matter. We love them all. Funny. Yes. Funny, serious, paranormal, true crime. You know Donna wants fucking ambient stories. I love the ambient stories. And all of the ones in between. Yep. So keep sending them in. And remember. Creep it real. And, and don't, don't get scared. scared.